Gracious and loving God, we lean this morning into your sovereignty, that you are the one that we can come to for help, that you are the one with resources, but more than simply resources, you are the one whose heart is burdened willingly by our pain, by our grief, and by our need. And we marvel that you welcome us to lay upon you our burdens in exchange for relationship, in exchange for dependency that is a great gift to us. You invite us to take the things that weigh heavily upon us and to lay them at your feet as if they were an offering, as if it were something that we bring in joy. But the truth is that we bring it with heaviness and we bring it feeling like there's nowhere else for us to turn and we bring it with a glimmer of hope that perhaps here at your throne of grace, we will find rest and mercy. We will find hope and light. We will find power and truth. These are the prayers that we have dared to speak aloud to one another this morning, but our hearts remain heavy with so many other concerns. So we ask in the silence of this moment that you would allow us to unload what weighs upon us, trusting that you are so much stronger and so much more able to endure what we've been trying to carry alone. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So this morning, we're looking at Mark chapter 9, verses 38 to 50, but it is always helpful to locate ourselves in the text. Reviewing from the end of chapter 8 up to where we are here in Mark, uh, we're at Mark 38, but this review, the lovely one that you see on your screen right now, uh, is just through 32. We have Jesus asking his disciples, who do you say that I am? Because remember, he asked, who do they say I am? But who do you say I am? Then we've got uh, the, the admonishment or the call to take up your cross. Uh, then we have the transfiguration. Then we've got this confrontation that he has with Peter, get behind me, Satan. And then, oh, I'm in the way. Now, I don't know what to do about the fact that I'm in the way. Um, <laughs> I can't get out of the way. Okay. I believe, help my unbelief, the story of the, uh, I, I gotta, I gotta fix that for future, uh, make sure I don't have anything down in the corner for, for future PowerPoint. I believe, help my unbelief that, that screen, you're not in the way. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Cool. Um, the statement of the father, uh, whose, whose child, um, what has what we would call epilepsy, but who appears to um, have the possession of a demon or an evil spirit, and the disciples were not able to uh, cast that spirit out. So that brings us up to where we were, and then we, well, no, not quite. Then we had this conversation. I want to revisit it with you this morning. This conversation that the disciples have of who is the greatest. So it's Mark. <laughs> it's Mark chapter 9, verses 33 to 37. Let's look at that again this morning. So they came to Capernaum. This is after the transfiguration where we were last week. They came to Capernaum and when Jesus was in the house, we assume it's probably Peter's house or Peter's uh, mother-in-law's house. It's, it's a bit of a full circle. Remember I told you that we were coming to the end of our Galilean ministry. 
So it's a bit of a full circle where we've gone back to Capernaum, which is where we started, where that first encounter with um, Jesus's healing power took place when he raised Peter's mother-in-law. And when Jesus was in the house, he asked them, and so we have this sense of intimacy, maybe it's just Jesus and his disciples. What were you talking about on the way? What were you discussing on the way? Remember, they were having a conversation along the way, but they kept silent for on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And we took a minute last week to just sort of like wonder why on earth, given all that, that uh, had happened last week, why is this the conversation that the disciples are having? That just seems bizarre, doesn't it? W why are they having, having, having three of them having encountered Moses, Elijah, and Jesus transfigured? The rest of them trying to cast out an evil spirit and being unable to do so. Um, and then learning from Jesus that this is the kind of spirit that requires prayer in order to cast out. How does any of that narrative lead to an argument as to who's the greatest? It's, it's, and so what we wondered last week is, was it Peter, James, and John saying, well, if I had been down uh, down the mountain instead of up with Jesus during the transfiguration, then uh, perhaps I would have been able to cast out this evil spirit. It is such a bizarre encounter, but it's one of those that contributes to this ongoing struggle. And we're going to look more at it again today, which is why I wanted to pause here for just a second. This ongoing struggle to really understand the magnitude, not just of Jesus's power, but the magnitude of the conflict that they were in the middle of. This is not just a little uh, conflict. You know, think about, think about the conflicts that have happened within Christianity over the course of time. If we were to step back and do an ancient church history course, one of the first conflicts that we would come across was the conflict that divided the Eastern and Western churches, the Orthodox and Catholic churches, um, over the Nicene Creed. And it's over this statement of, um, it's the Greek word is homoousius. Uh, and it's over this, it's so, and what it's describing is, is the Holy Spirit of the same substance, homoousius, same substance, as the Father and the Son, or is the Holy Spirit of a different or lesser substance? So there was this argument that was happening within the ancient church where they were trying to understand um, what some would call the Godhead or the Trinity, and they were trying to understand how does this work? You know, is God the most powerful and then Jesus a little less so and then the Holy Spirit even less than? Except that scripture's witness suggests that, that all three of them have always been. In the beginning was the word and the whole the wind of God or the spirit of God moved over the chaos before creation took place. So there was a conflict at the Council of Nicaea where they were trying to determine is the Holy Spirit a product, if you will, of God and Jesus so that the Holy Spirit is down here? Or is God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit all of the same substance? The homoousius. And, uh, and so you find that the Western church says, yes, it is. they are of the same substance, begotten, not made, we say, of the Spirit and of Jesus. Um, very God of very God. If you know the Nicene Creed, you might recognize some of these phrases that I'm speaking. Well, the Nicene Creed is not a creed that is spoken in the Orthodox Church because it is the thing that ultimately, now granted, there were political issues and there were leadership issues as well. But from a theological perspective, what divided the, the Western and Eastern Church or the Catholic and Orthodox Church theologically was this argument about the a priori or the 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 priority of God first, and that somehow the Holy Spirit was lesser than. So having said, and, and then think about, think about the conflicts that you've had in the 20th century in the church. 
you know, women have only been ordained in the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America since the late 60s. Um, and uh, in the South, not until the 70s. And there are still big uh, churches in the South that do not ordain women. So we know that that is a, a point of diversion for a certain uh, theological strains in the church is arguments over the role of women. There are more arguments we could talk all day about the various places where the church was divided. We know the role, the, the doctrine of sanctification is one of the things that divided the Catholic church from the Protestant church and that divides the Anglican church of which Methodism is part from the, the reformed church of which Presbyterian is a part. So this kind of argument, who is greater, it's not new. We see it even here before the establishment of the church in the disciples themselves. And it's this trying to capture, trying to hold onto or contain an understanding of God, of the spirit, of Jesus, of um, God having broken through. So Jesus sits down and he calls the 12 to him and he says to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And we're thinking, okay, this is not what we're, this is not what we're going for here. <laughs> Remember that we have a tendency to recreate in the images in which we know, and then we can only tweak those by a little bit. So if the disciples are thinking that this is a new religion or a new strain of Judaism or a new source of authority, then what they know are the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers, and the scribes of the tradition in which they were raised. So they're starting to think, okay, so if we're starting something new here, who's the chief priest? Who among us is gonna be in control here? If what Jesus is saying is true and he's gonna go away, then who's gonna be the head honcho, the top dog? I think maybe we should make up the chief priests and maybe you guys make up you know, the lesser folks, and maybe y'all are just teachers, and you can see how they're taking a system that they know and understand, and they're trying to recreate it and put themselves in it, and Jesus is like, oh my gosh, <laughs> A, you're missing the mark, B, that is so small, like it's so narrow of a, de of a definition, and, and by the way, if what you're searching for is power and authority, the only way for you to take hold of that is to be last, is to be servant. Now we can't comprehend that when we're trying to comprehend that within the context in which these men are living, in which this society has been structured, in which this religion has been uh, institutionalized. Because we don't have the long view of Jesus. We just have what's in front of us and, and trying to figure that out. And Jesus is saying that for the, the very first step, if you're going to get this, the very first step has to be that you, um, you've got to be nothing in order to be something. You have to be last and servant if you're ever going to find yourself um, in line. So he took a child and he put the child in the middle of these disciples and children, it, again, it's a societal, um, under, cultural understanding. Children are not valued. They're valued for what they might become, but they are not valued right now for for who they are. The, and men especially don't have a lot to do with children. They are the realm of women and it's women who care for them. I don't think that we should go so far as to think that, that men don't love their, their children. But from a cultural perspective, the men are busy 
and they've got either work to do to provide for the family or, you know, having stepped out of that identity and following Jesus, Jesus is the priority. So Jesus then brings this child in their midst and he takes the child into his arms. And again, it's not that men ever pick, never picked up their children. It's not that there wasn't any affection. I think we have a tendency sometimes to sort of think that. I, I just have a hard time believing that men in, in uh, 2021 who embrace their children and love them, uh, men who have a tendency to turn their babies facing outward and holding them, you know, with the sort of football crotch hold, I have a hard time believing that they didn't do that then as well. So we want to be careful that we don't so other these men as to, um, to, to make them not not human, um, but but the realm of women and children was more separated from the realm of men than what um, we experience today. So he takes the child, puts them in the midst, takes them in his arms, and he says to his disciples, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So think about what it is to receive a child. I'm not talking about going and snatching a child off of a playground somewhere. I'm talking about what it's like to be in the middle of doing something and have a child tugging on the end of your shirt. I'm talking about the tendency that children have to um, invade your personal space. I'm talking about the fact that if you sit on the couch and there's a sectional sofa, a child is not going to sit on the opposite end of the sofa from where you're sitting. They're going to sit on top of you. And if they're not sitting on top of you, they're going to be sitting next to you in such a way that they're touching you. And there's this little bit of tendency to be like, could I have a little space? <laughs> Why are you touching me? Could you move over a little bit? And, and what Jesus is saying is the invitation is to open up yourself, to open up your physical being to the embrace of a child. And if we are all children of God, then we are being invited to embrace one another, to allow for the invasion of our personal space, to, to wrap our arms around someone who is in need, to not other others, the ones who are demon possessed, the ones who are malformed, the ones who our society has said are unclean. Our society has said are broken, but instead to welcome them into us in a physical way, in an intellectual way, in a spiritual way, in a soulful way to embrace one another. That, that kind of care for God's creation, for God's sons and daughters that's the ministry that Jesus is calling his disciples to. It is not a ministry about them. It's not a ministry about their own personal gain. It is a ministry of what happens to one another when we embrace each other, when we invite each other in, when we care for one another. That's what Jesus is calling us to. So then Mark 9, 38 through 41 so John says to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. There's a little bit of deflection maybe going on here. Let's change the subject because that's starting to feel a little uncomfortable. Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon after to speak evil of me for the one who is not against us is for us. For truly, I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. And now this is stunning because I wonder how many of you in this moment are thinking, is that how it goes? That's not how I remember that going. I thought if you're not for us, then you're against us. 
And Jesus has turned that saying on its head to say, if you're not against us, then you're for us. And wow, if ever there were a statement relevant to 2021, the Christian church today, it is that one. Because, oh my goodness, are we good at being against one another, at being against how one another worships, the kind of music one another likes, the version of scripture we prefer. We are good at being against one another with regard to denomination. We are a good at being against one another with regard to the language that we use. Do you use inclusive language? Do you use exclusive language. We are good at being against one another um, when we uh, pursue the finer points of theology and suggest that you're not going to make it into the kingdom because your view of, of what happens at the table is uh, wrong and therefore you're not going to make it to that great banquet table. It's unbelievable how good we are at being against one another. And this statement comes in the context of Jesus asking his disciples to be for the other, to be for the ones who are in need of the gospel, to be for anyone who doesn't yet know that Jesus is Lord. And it's a warning. It's a warning that you think you know. <laughs> you think that you've got this right. Um, but you're going to find out that you're wrong over and over and over again. And these, these, um, these pithy sayings of Jesus, as I have a tendency to call this part of Mark, it's, it's a reminder over and over again that chances are we've got it wrong before we've got it right. That um, think about, go back to it. Peter appalled at what Jesus is saying about being arrested and, and, and being set on trial and being, uh, being killed, crucified. Peter is saying, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. And Jesus is, it, Jesus is like, you're wrong. <laughs> and then Peter, James, and John up on the Mount of Transfiguration, wanting to build uh, tabernacles for Moses and Elijah and Jesus. And, and again, they're wrong. And then the, um, attempt at, at casting out the demon and assuming that the problem is the child's and not their own. They're wrong. And now they're arguing about who is the greatest. And once again, they're wrong. What would it look like for all of us to approach one another and the text and what we've always held to be true what we've always held to be dear and ask the question, could I be wrong? How might that open our arms up to embrace one another? How might that give us the possibility of hearing it from another perspective? I have a friend this week who wrote a, an email, um, just, you know, it was just an email about a publication that, um, that is, you know, circulates Presbyterian churches like ours. Um, and in the, e you know, and it's a publication that, you know, I read, I feel like it's one of those things that keeps me, um, keeps my academic brain working because it's written very much in academic speak. And I don't know if y'all remember being in school and sort of realizing that that is a muscle that you have to exercise. Like if you read some of the, some of the like academic works, uh, if you were to en enroll in a graduate course today, like there was, there would be some like stretching that your brain has to do in order to be able to hang with that kind of writing. It's not, it is not chicken soup for the soul kind of writing, you guys. It's like meaty stuff and, and it takes a while to get through some of it. And this publication is kind of like that. It's meaty. It takes me a little while to get through it. I got to read it with a pen and a highlighter in hand and, uh, and kind of think on it. And so I've always, I mean, I honestly have kind of patted myself on the back, like, yay me, I'm still reading this kind of work. I'm still forcing myself to exercise that part of my brain. And, um, and this friend wrote about this publication, pointing out that it's actually kind of this exercise in Western, um, highly educated, predominantly white, um, 
arrogant uh, presentation of theological matters. And, uh, and I kind of got kicked in the gut by this email because I thought, wow, I really haven't thought about that. <laughs> and that, that it lends a certain superiority in my brain, whether I want it or not, um, because I think, look at me, I'm, I'm able to read this kind of stuff. And yet what he was pointing out is that it is wholly lacking in a global view. It's wholly lacking in a stratified socioeconomic perspective. It fails to ask the question, how is this relevant to, uh, to a person living in a slum outside of, of Nairobi for whom the gospel is as meaningful and valuable and able to be um, proclaimed how is it relevant for that person as much as it may be relevant for a person of great wealth uh, living in, let's say, Singapore? Uh, if you watch Crazy Rich Asians, think about the Bible study that, that was taking place in that movie in, in one of the most gorgeous homes that I think I've ever seen. How often have we narrowed down Christianity uh, into the specifics of our own context. And what damage do we do to it when we do that? How do we fail to, um, to imagine a love that God has for the whole world when we limit it to questions of who's the greatest and we're only involving the 12 of us because we do that, yeah? This is hard when we push this statement too far because I talked earlier about the divisions in the church and there's real heresy in the church. There's like real genuine bad teaching. And we do want to make sure that the bad teaching isn't something that that um, gets propagated in such a way that you um, come to a place of believing that you have to earn your salvation. We don't want bad teaching to get pushed along in such a way that, that you... Um, that you think that though scripture says there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because you have a story that somehow is defined as impure, that scripture is not relevant to you. We want to be sure that what we're communicating about the gospel, we're communicating um, in the love of Jesus, in the freedom of our salvation, in the hope that we have in Christ, in the telling the truth about ourselves and our brokenness. But at the end of the day, Jesus is saying here, listen, don't make yourself about policing what other people are saying in my name, you know, what, what power people are engaging in my name, because if they're engaging power in my name, they're not against us. And at least in this moment, Jesus is preparing them for a battle that is going to take place. And this is not an earthly battle, though it will be played out in the earthly realm. This is a spiritual battle. We already know it because Satan has shown up at least once, maybe twice, depending upon that encounter with, with Peter on the scene. So what are we going to do about that? Well, let's look at a couple of texts in the Old Testament to see if we can understand this context a little bit better. By context, I mean, don't stop the guy who's casting out demons in my name, because if he does a mighty work in my name, 
soon afterwards, it's unlikely that he'd speak evil of me for the one who is not against us is for us. So if you look at Numbers chapter 11, verses 26 to 30, you see a similar kind of setup and a similar response from Moses. Now, two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. Notice the authority right there. And also, if you think the spirit shows up only at Pentecost, here's one of those places that you can be reminded that the spirit has been actively at work from the very beginning. The spirit rested upon these two men who remained in the camp. They were among those registered. So registered meaning they were counted as Israelites belonging to one of the 12 tribes. But they had not gone out to the tent, so they hadn't been obedient to the call for all men to come um, to gather. So, but they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on all of them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. So wonderful statement here. One is Moses making sure that we're keeping the focus in the right place, which is on the spirit of the Lord, not on his own authority. And the other is the expanding of our view. Young men dream visions, old men, uh, young men have visions, old men dream dreams. The, the idea that we are not limited here by, by category when it comes to God's ability to call people as prophets, as teachers, as healers. And Moses has this right. He has not allowed his authority to go to his head. Thanks be to God. And then in Matthew chapter 12, 22 to 30, we have a similar kind of uh, debate, if you will, about authority and where that comes from. So a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus and Jesus healed the man so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and they said, can this be the son of David? Wondering, is there some royal lineage? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, no way does this guy have the authority of the house of David. Why? Well, frankly, because it would put him over them according to the hierarchical structure that they've created for the Judaism that they're living out in this time. So what do they do instead? Instead of recognizing God's authority as Moses did and celebrating that the spirit has rested on Eldad and Medad in Numbers, the Pharisees instead are are wanting to hold on to their own power. And one of the ways that we hold on to our own power is by denigrating others. So they denigrate Jesus by saying, no, it's Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. His power comes not because he's from the house of David, not because he's from God, not because the spirit of God has rested upon him, but because the evil one has rested upon him. And then you have this wonderful phrase, we've looked at it before in other contexts, knowing their thoughts, like Jesus doesn't even have to hear their argument, he knows their thoughts. And this is consistent with Psalm 139, yes, before a word is even on my lips, you know it. It's a, it's a um, hint of his divinity. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. Now that verse alone is prophetic for what will happen to Judaism if they continue to oppose Jesus, the one whom God has called as the fulfillment of his scriptures. No city or house divided against itself will stand. 
And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. So Jesus is speaking on two levels here, right? On the one level, he's making that theoretical argument to say, well, if Satan is divided against himself, then how does Satan have the power to cast himself out? And what value would there be to Satan casting Satan out? But what he's also saying is that on a the theoretical level doesn't make any sense. But that in a practical level, if you oppose me, you and occupied people who have very little power over your life as it is, if you oppose me, we will see division. We will see destruction. We will see what ultimately happens about 40 years after Jesus's death, which is the absolute shuddering of the people in the land and the diaspora that occurs that sends nearly all of the Jews outside of this promised land that was given to them. But back to that base level argument with the Pharisees, if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? So if anybody's able to cast out demons, how, it, where is that power? Where does it come from? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is, I gotta go this way. Whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters fascinating statement here because it feels opposite of what we just read in Mark. If you're, if you're not against me, then you're with me here. We have, if you're not with me, then you're against me. Well, but that certainly is true within the church, isn't it? We need to be for one another. And we, at the end of the day, need to be for Jesus. How about this? I got the flames coming out of my head. That is a good looking, good looking look, isn't it? Yeah, I think someone should like screenshot that and say, this is what happens when our associate pastor teaches. <laughs> so we go back to Mark chapter nine, verse 42 through 48. I'm getting there. We're almost done uh, because we um, have three minutes left before 11 o'clock. And I want you to have time in your small groups. So whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell with, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, for everyone will be salted with fire. Wow. Holy cow. I thought we, you know, they were like, we were just having a conversation about who might be in charge when Jesus leaves. And all of a sudden we're in the middle of this big like statement of, ugh. okay. So what on earth, what, what on earth could this mean? Well, I think that we need to understand this within the context of Jesus. And we have now for two weeks, not done a whole lot or gone a whole lot of places, but we've seen that there's this shift that's taking place, this orientation where Jesus is becoming pointed towards Jerusalem. And I, I think we underestimate just how big the battle is that Jesus faced for us on the cross. I think that we have a tendency or I don't, you know what, y'all probably are way more spiritual than I am. I have a tendency to bring the battle entirely to earth where it's a, a, a conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus. It's a power play that the Pharisees are making. They enlist the Romans to help them out and they end up killing this man. But we don't want that to be the whole story, do we? because there's very little power in that. Even if this man were killed as part of a power play between sort of a new Judaism and the old guard of Judaism, and even if Jesus were raised from the dead somehow, 
we don't want that to be all there is to this story. We don't want this to be only an earthly battle because at the end of the day, there's no power in it being an earthly battle. The power lies in this being a spiritual battle. The power lies in this being a battle about heaven and hell and, and your soul and mine and dominion over all of creation. That's where the power of Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection lies. So if that is the case, then how do you need to gird your loins for the battle that is, that is in front of us? So think about it in that context of leaving Egypt during the Passover um, and, and kind of where we are today. Leaving Egypt during the Passover, what's important? It's important that you're ready to go. As soon as the angel of death passes over the houses, kills the new, the, the firstborn of all who are not marked by the blood of the lamb, you need to get your stuff and go. And some of you, Glennis is on this call, um, some of you are, are uh, uniquely aware of contexts in which people have had to take their stuff and go immediately, not knowing when they're coming back. And they have to strap their children on them. Um, they're being persecuted and, and they're being run out of their homes. And, and at the end of the day, they need, what do they need? They need food. They need their children with them. They need what else? laptop, cell phone, photo album. You know, we all kind of start out that way. We bring as much as we can carry today. And then we realize tomorrow that we can't carry all that stuff. And so we have to start shedding it. If we understand the context that Jesus is about to walk into, the battle that he's facing as not just an earthly battle, but a spiritual battle, and that he's calling us, he's calling his disciples in particular, but all of us to accompany him into that, then we want to make sure that we are not trying to carry into it a bunch of stuff that we really don't need. We don't need our laptops. We don't need our cell phones. We don't need our photo albums. We need the power of prayer. We need to be united with one another. We need not to be distracted by arguments as to whether or not you have more power than I do. We need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. And that means that if there are things that are distracting us from being able to focus our attention on Jesus, we need to cut it out. So think about it, it's very harsh, right? I mean, who's gonna cut off their own hand? Um, but think about it like this. Uh, consider, if you will, the orders, the, the sacred orders um, that are in the Catholic Church, people um, uh, who, who enter um, into the priesthood or to become a nun or to become a monk. It's, it's a call upon their lives to shed their possessions and to shed any aspirations towards earthly gain in order to free them for um, spirit, doing spiritual battle for the Lord, winning souls to Christ, praying for the world, um, attending to, to needs. Each of the orders have different flavors or identities, if you will. Uh, so Leif, as you know, goes to a little Catholic school down the, down the street, and it's a Jesuit school. And the Jesuits tend to have an identity towards social justice. And, and so those who are called into that order are oriented towards the needs of the world. So we have to think for ourselves, what, what is God calling me into and what does that require me to let go of? What does that require even sometimes to painfully let go of from my life? An old way of, of looking at a particular um, argument, a... Uh, a desire for um, collecting, uh, you know, maybe just that sort of thought that I want to be famous. <laughs> 
and uh and 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 instead to let that go you know i'm never going to be lady gaga singing the the national anthem uh in quite the outfit shall we say uh at somebody's inauguration um and and if if that's my desire it's a very earthly desire and and if i'm like focusing my attention on it then it's taking up space in my life that is preventing me from doing what the Lord might have me do. I think we've all entered into periods of time where we're like, oh my gosh, you know what? I am really distracted by Netflix. I think I need to step away from it. Or, oh my goodness, I have gone down the rabbit hole of TikTok and I just need to remove that app from my phone. Or um, I've become so obsessed with exercise that, I, um, that I've lost the joy of going for a simple walk. Um, I, I want so much to fill my uh, I, iPhone or I, I Apple Watch uh, rings to make, complete them that I that I'm unwilling to set that desire aside in order to make myself available for someone who's asking me to make myself available. That's what's going on here in these texts is the invitation for us to examine ourselves and ask, what is the thing that is causing such a distraction in our lives that we are not um, making ourselves free and available for Christ? And then the very last, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. In other words, pay attention to how you taste rather than how everybody else tastes. Because some of us are a little more salty than others. And that's okay. Let's pray. Gracious God, we want to be tasty for you. We want our lives to um, bring flavor uh, to the goodness of your presence and the power of your love. So we ask that you would use us, that you would free us from the things that distract us, that we might be mighty warriors of love for the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.